Hi, my name's Gary, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about a brief history of data processing. So, in the beginning, we had computers and data, and we dealt with things like accounting transactions, financial transactions, inventory management, human resource management, people in, coming and going from companies. And for that, we used a database. And the database was simple in the fact that we wanted to put stuff in, take stuff out, and do so reliably and quickly. And then we'd get to a point where we'd want to ask a question of that database. And the database would say, just a moment, please. I'm busy doing some other things. So that led us to think about how do we build a bigger, faster database? And what ultimately happened there is that is a challenging problem to solve in the world of technology. And maybe this isn't as easy as we thought. So next came this idea of we need a data warehouse. And the database should meet the data warehouse, but very clearly, those two things are not connected, and we're now part of the ETL gap, the extract, transform, and load. And never sh the two shall meet, meaning the database and the data warehouse remain disconnected. Gartner notes four ways that a uh, database management system is holding you back, and they all relate to this split. They note ETL holding you back, analytic latency, meaning that by the time you do the analytics on your data warehouse, your data is inherently out of date, synchronization challenges because you have to keep these two data stores aligned, and copies of data because you're moving and multiplying the data set. So why did we separate these things? It was primarily performance, 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 and a little bit of governance. So let's look at the primary performance impediment, which for years was disk drives. Uh, today, fortunately, we're into the world of flash and SSDs, but for a long time it was uh, disk drive performance. So we looked to see how we could scale up for databases and data warehouses, and we found that that scale-up approach was complex and costly. So there was a quest for scale out. Um, and, and there were paths that were taken across the database world and the data warehouse world. In the database world, we had the NoSQL wave, and in the data warehouse world, we had the Hadoop ecosystem. Now, NoSQL theory was about scale, performance, eventual consistency, and no need for SQL, hence NoSQL. But the reality check of NoSQL was that in seeking scale and performance, it was best to stick to one thing at a time. In seeking consistency, the uh, feedback was just wait. And in seeking analytics, well, thank goodness for SQL on NoSQL. Now, the Hadoop theory was just to store it. And, you know, who needs a schema? Uh, and let's learn MapReduce. And can we compute on disk? No problem. But in reality, data lakes are deep and dark, and it's unclear what's going on. It can be hard to fill shoes with MapReduce and cater to all those things needed for the larger ecosystem engineering. And it occasionally feels like the whole data strategy is upside down. And what's the one thing never intended for NoSQL and Hadoop? Well, SQL. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? So Hadoop, and primarily HDFS, is a file system, not really a database. And NoSQL is really just part of a complete solution. And in fact, many solutions, uh, relational solutions, support unstructured data, like a JSON data format. So why did we pursue a split uh, with the data warehouse, NoSQL, and HDFS. Again, it goes back to this idea of performance, 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 and governance. So here's an idea. What if we use memory? And what if we use memory, but understandably architect for persistence? And what about Flash? Well, Solutions and the right solutions will span the entirety of the media spectrum across memory, flash, SSDs, and disk, you name it. And we have new technology like distributed systems. We have old technology like relational databases, which have been proudly serving SQL since, since 1970. And so do we really have to split databases and data warehouses? What if we merged with in-memory solutions? And well, OK, now I need to worry about high costs. Well, actually, you can distribute. And you can scale across low-cost machines or in the cloud. 
So there's an incredible opportunity to take advantage of memory at very low cost. And do I need to give up SQL for all of this? And the answer is no. You can orchestrate a multi-model solution. You can have full transactional SQL with inserts and updates and deletes. You can have JSON for unstructured or semi-structured data, and later on convert that JSON to SQL. Uh, Geospatial, Spark, and other data types for multi-model. And not all of the data needs to be in memory exactly. You can combine in-memory data with disk and flash-based data, for example, on a column store. You can keep the real-time data in memory and perhaps keep the historical data on disk. And you can query both data stores through a single interface. And what happens if a node goes down? And uh, Well, you can replicate for availability. Uh, and what happens if I need to recover? Well, you can persist your logs to, to disk, and you can take snapshots and make backups so that you have that if you need to recover. So the real uh, mission here is to explore the possibilities, to consider what's possible with in-memory relational distributed databases that, in addition to supporting relational, support multi-model approaches. Uh, to deploy a software, whether that's for your data center or in the cloud, uh, to build real-time data pipelines and analytics to help you understand what's happening at the front lines of your business now and not yesterday or last month, and to fit with a new world of modern applications. So with that, I ask you to find your inner SQL. I thank you for taking the time to listen uh, to this short presentation. Hope you enjoy, and take care.